That's what we want to take a look at today. But we're talking and, and we began with the fact that the Apostle Paul said he was called to preach the gospel and he, he's, he's telling the, the folk there at Rome. Now, when we also look and, and the scripture that we're using today uh, and looking at is the great commission that Jesus gave his disciples in Matthew 28. While we're going to use this as uh, uh, taking a look at preaching the gospel and, and being trusted with the gospel, we're going to also take a look at how the Apostle Paul applied that in the church at Thessalonica. So here is the Great Commission. And um, now there's some interesting statements made here, and we're going to begin here in Matthew 28 and verse 16. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go, and when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. I am surely, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now, there's a lot of elements in here that we want to take a look at. So he gives the disciples this commission. In this, Jesus entrusted to the disciples the gospel. Now, I want to venture to say a little bit here that there's a difference between being entrusted with something and trusted. Because when we look at the difference, the directive here, he can entrust us with something, but does that mean that we can be trusted to do that and to follow through in what he has given us to do in the way in which he has given us to do this? So some of the parts of the directive here that we need to understand in terms of being trusted with the gospel is that we are to teach all nations. There is a teaching process in, in the gospel. And it is all nations. So this is a, a broader concept than just teaching Israelites, just teaching the Jewish nation, uh, just teaching a, a select group of people, but rather to teach all nations. Then also in this process of trusting with, with the gospel, it is baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We find the triune God here. Uh, the involvement of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, but baptism is a public profession of your conviction and your willingness to serve God. So in terms of trusting uh, the gospel being trusted to us, there has to be this baptism. And when we understand, even as Paul writes about a baptism, it's, it's the burial of the old self and the resurrection or the raising up of a new man. Important in terms of trusting the gospel as well. Then he tells them here in this commission, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Now, Jesus has commandments that he gave his disciples. Obviously, the one that we probably know most of all is that if you are my disciples, you know, I, I, in essence, I command you to love one another. And by this shall all men know that you are, you are my disciples. But to observe all things I have commanded you. Jesus not only made commandments, but he had things that he told the disciples, uh, sayings they talked about in the sermon that he gave on the, on the mount for us. And then he says, and this helps us in terms of trusting in the gospel, I'm with you even to the end of the age. So this goes beyond just the immediate disciples or the apostles. It, it comes into our time, our age, 
in our responsibility as well to the end of the, of the earth or the end of the age. So again, the question is, can you be trusted with this gospel? And I have mentioned that God entrusted it. I wanted to give us some examples because um, the difference between trust and entrusted. God entrusted the creation to Adam and Eve. He gave them directives. He says, you know, you are to dress it. You are to keep it. Uh, he entrusted them to one another and the like. Uh, with that, though, we, we see that he entrusted them but they ended up not being trustworthy. They did not keep uh, what God had told them to keep. In fact, what the devil did is, he, the devil worked to get them to trust him because he, he starts out with this um, questioning, you know, well, God said this, and there's a lack of, of trust then that is developed in Adam and Eve, and they're not trusting God. So we see that. So mankind has fallen short in what God has entrusted to us. And God the, the Father can and does fully trust Jesus and with what he has entrusted him with. Now, there's a difference between Jesus and you and I. The Father has entrusted him and Jesus is totally trustworthy in all of these things. Now, I also want to uh, mention that how we respond and how we feel when we know that we are trusted. And I want to eventually come to recognize that Jesus, us to recognize that Jesus does trust us, which changes how we approach the gospel. Now, Paul was entrusted to preach the gospel to the Gentiles, and he did that. And God could trust him to do it. We, we recognize uh, how difficult it was, but you certainly can trust him because he was stoned, he was beaten, he was shipwrecked, he gave his life. And even the example of God with Abraham, the willingness to sacrifice his son, God in essence says, I know now that you will do these things that I have given to you. So Paul when entrusted to preach the gospel of the Gentile, Paul was opposed by religious leaders. So we want to take a look at some of the problems and difficulties that he had because when it's entrusted to you and I, they're by religious leaders who did not trust Jesus. He also found people unwilling to share the gospel of the kingdom of God. Now that may seem like a small thing, but I believe is a is a huge thing in so many ways for us to understand because he says, go and teach them all things I've commanded you, teach all nations these things. And then also in, in sharing the gospel, their unwillingness to share the true Messiah with sinners. Um, so these are challenges in trusting us with the gospel. Are we willing to share the gospel with sinners? Uh, are we willing to share in the way God wants us to? And then the unwillingness in sharing the gospel, the unwillingness to lift heavy burdens. Now, Jesus, of course, talked to the scribes and Pharisees and he talked about all the traditions and he said, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. You know, you put all of these burdens on people. You're, you're unwilling to, to take a finger to lift off any of the, the burdens. This is important when we think about trusting us with the gospel. Are we willing to help people? One of the things that, that from my perspective, and I'm not saying it's correct, that, that I kind of saw that when I was working towards my master's degree in psychology and then my licensing in marriage and family therapy, it is like people who had gone before and gotten their license they wanted to make sure that those that followed them had it as difficult as they did, and even more. And it didn't seem like to me that they, they were as, as helpful in some ways as you, as you would like for people to be. We as Christians can feel the same way, that 
uh, entrusting us with the gospel, well, I had it tough, and I want them to have it equally as tough. Uh, they're not getting out of this unscathed. But that's just, just a thought here. So the willingness to, to help people and to loose them from traditions that do not promote the gospel. So now let's take a look at what Jesus tells us and how Jesus pronounces the gospel is. And this is in Luke chapter 4, verse 16 through 21. I know you're familiar with it, but we need to read it just so that we understand Jesus' approach here in understanding and, and helping us to understand what the gospel and the intentionality that Jesus had in teaching the gospel. So in Luke chapter 4, and beginning here in, in verse 16, we read Jesus, he went to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue. So th there's, there's a point about teaching the gospel that if you're in your own community, we're going to see you're not oftentimes well received. As, his, as, as it was his custom, and he stood up and read, uh, and he stood up to read rather, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written. Now, there is intentionality in all of this. He, he was given the scroll. It is the book of Isaiah, but he was looking for something particular. Sp yeah, a specific scripture. And it was, again, from the book of Isaiah, where he says, the spirit of the Lord is on me. Important in terms of the, of the gospel is that it has the guidance and direction of God. The spirit of God is upon me because he has anointed me. Now this is a, a when we talk about uh, anointing, we're talking about a calling, we're talking about a commission. It is, it is talking about a responsibility, which the apostle Paul also talked about there in the book of Romans. He had been called by God to preach the gospel. He has anointed me to preach good news or the gospel to the poor. He has sent me, not only has he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of the sight for the blind and to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. These, are, these things are all good. They are good for humanity and, and God's favor. And then he rolled up the scroll, he gave it back to the tenant and sat down and the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began by saying to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And they, all, they spoke well of him until they realized he's, you know, from Nazareth here, he's Joseph's son. Therefore, they dismiss that. They dismiss the word of God. They dismiss Jesus in this gospel. Now, so Jesus told his disciples they were to go out and teach the world. Now, let's take a look at a couple of things that might help us to, to see and understand that not only has he entrusted us with the gospel, but we are trusted by Jesus. And that is in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, and, his, and verse, through verse 16, Jesus gives us two examples. He first of all tells his disciples, you are the salt of the earth. Now, he doesn't just suggest that. He says, that's what you are. In that statement, there's a amount of trust given. That's who you are. He also says that, and, and you're not to lose your savor. Um, if just left to ourselves, we tend to lose our savor, but the gospel always has savor to it. It has flavor to it. It has nourishment to it. It has encouragement to it. And then he goes on also to say that we are a light to the world and that a light isn't hid under a bushel, it's put up on a hill, and it, it, it's a light to the world. So he calls us both a salt of the earth, and he calls us a light to the world. Those are positive statements made of his disciples, our calling, and our responsibility. 
Now, with those thoughts in mind that we, the Great Commission, is, a, is that God, Jesus, has all authority and power in heaven and earth. He has called us. We are to baptize in the name of, of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We are to teach them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and I'm with you to the ends of the earth. Now, here's where the rubber meets the road, and here's where it gets difficult. So I want to go to First Thessalonians chapter 1 and 2. And let's take a look at what the Apostle Paul is telling this church in, and the membership there in terms of the gospel and what to do. So he says here, in beginning here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, in verse 1, it's Paul, Silas, and Timothy to the church at the, of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So the church, again, the focus, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all of that, Grace and peace be to you. And this is how God begins the salutation when we think about the gospel. It is grace and peace to us. And then it's under this caption, a thanksgiving to the Thessalonians' faith. I always thank God for all of you. This is very, very inclusive. This is very, very uh, comforting. It is very helpful that we are, he is thanking them for them. Mentioning you in our prayers, we continually remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor promote, prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. So we see here, as we begin this in verse 1 through 3, the gospel focus is on God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ that the gospel is in verse three, which is a work of faith. Faith is, uh, you know, evidence of things not seen. It's a faith. It is also a labor of love. It is patient in of hope. So when, when Jesus has entrusted the gospel to us, it has to be with the thought that there is a heavenly father there is a Jesus Christ. There is a, a, as my wife mentioned, he is our Lord, our Savior, and our King. Now, in terms of God trusting us, even if we, and this is not in your scriptures, but I know that you're, you're well aware of this. In the book of Revelations, it talks about us being made kings and priests. Okay, those are responsibilities in which you trust the person that they have that responsibility. The fact that, we are called friends is one of the most incredible trustworthy things that Jesus says of his disciples and that he trusts us to love one another. These, these things are important for all of us in understanding and being entrusted with the gospel. So the gospel is a work of faith. It is a labor of love and it's patient. So when we're entrusted with the gospel, it is, it's a part of having the faith of God, the faith of Christ. It is also a part of a work, labor of love, uh, which is work. Uh, so entrusting us with the gospel, it is work and it is patient in hope. So when we're trusted with the gospel and we're working with people, it is you continue to have a patience and a hope in the gospel itself and the gospel doing its work. Now, verse four here, it tells us, for we know brothers, God loved by God, that he has chosen you. Now, this is a heavenly calling. So what has he entrusted us with? He has entrusted us with a heavenly calling, a heavenly election here. And then he says in verse five, because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord in spite of severe suffering. You welcomed the message with the joy of given by the Holy Spirit. Several things here in this endorsement, in this direction, and trusting us with the, with, um, the gospel. 
It is the spirit of God's involvement in our receiving it and our understanding it and convicting us and helping us to have a joy at the gospel of Jesus Christ in spite of the fact that there are things that you suffer. And the, because the, the gospel brings difficulty and is going to bring some, as we go through this, I think we're going to see some difficulties that we may not have thought of in times past, but God has entrusted us with this gospel. So we see the, the Holy Spirit. Now, in verse 7 through 9 here, in entrusting us with the gospel, he goes on this. And so you became a model of all believers in Macedonia and Achaia. Acacia, the Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about you. This is an example of the gospel emanating from us radiating from us and he's saying you are an example of the gospel so he has entrusted us to be an example of the gospel the good news it's kind of like when the the statement is that is made as well in the bible where it says you know that be ready always to give an answer for the the hope that lies within you The gospel gives us incredible hope no matter what the situation is. He helps us to hope. He helps us to have faith. He helps us to have love. And in these examples, this goes back to what Jesus said in in Matthew 5 that I referred to later, earlier on was that we are the salt of the earth, we are the light of the world, and we are teaching the things that Jesus has taught us, the commandments, the saying, and we have joy in the gospel, the good news, and the joy that helps the brokenhearted, helps people to be set free, a joy, the gospel that gives sight to those who are blind and who have no hope, and also a gospel that shows favor. Favor from whom? Favor from God and God's involvement in our life. So now, in verse 10, as we go on here, though, we see some other things. And in this particular case now, we're looking, uh, and this is about patience here in verse 10. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, who rescues us from the coming wrath. In all of this, we, we're again reminded of the truth of the gospel, what we can trust in, for example, you know, in my father's house or many offices were not so, I will come again, that he has ascended to heaven, that he is resurrected from the dead, that the gospel again is good news and it has hope even if we were to die, but also this passage here has a warning about a wrath to come. Because we can kind of, in in the gospel sometimes, we we can tend to think that it's all good news and nobody, everybody just kind of waltzes into the kingdom of God and everybody just kind of is, is ushered into heaven and all these things. And he says, there is a wrath to come. There, we live in a world that is, as I say, we kind of trudge through this world and the world's way is a way of death. It ends. It, uh, Satan is, is a murderer and a liar, and Satan has dispatched his lie and the subtlety of his lie into this w- world, and so there's a warning to come. So then we begin chapter 2 of this letter about the gospel, and it's about his ministry. And so I th- this speaks then to the trust that we have that God has given to his ministry and, and all of us in ministering because we all have ways in which we minister to others, ourselves, and like. He says, you know, brothers, that our visit to you was not a failure. We had previously suffered and been insulted in Philippi, as you know. 
But with the help of our God, we dared to tell you his gospel in spite of strong opposition. So he's, he's saying, and it can appear that it was a failure. It's not working out. He, he can trust us to continue to do what he wants us to do in spite of opposition. The gospel has received lots and lots of opposition. And in our world today, we find that the Bible has a lot of opposition. We find that Jesus has a lot of opposition. One true God has a lot of opposition. Uh, There's just a lot of opposition in so many different ways. So we see this here. But Paul then tells us how he presented the gospel. Now, I'll I'll let you think your own thoughts on this, but this is what Paul said, that how he presented it and how that in entrusting the gospel to us, that we've got to be very careful how we present it to others. For For the appeal we made does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as men approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. And we are not trying to please men, but God who tests our hearts. So we find here in this regard, and the way the King James Version puts it here, it it says here that Paul presented the gospel without deceit, without uncleanness, or without guile. It is difficult sometimes in pastoral ministry in wanting to present the gospel to, and and this is what Paul encountered. You know, you look at so many examples in in the letters he wrote. There were people who were opposing him, people who were drawing people away. They were teaching false doctrines. They were doing all these things and and they were aggrandizing themselves. Uh, Pastoral ministry has that power to sway you and and deceive you if, if you're not careful. And it also, ministry has an incredible pull for public opinion. People take polls. What do you want to do? How do you want to, to do this? And we live in a very diverse society with different ideas with oftentimes with no question as, what does God say? What would God have us do? Um, Love has become an overriding, diverse thing, but love as we define it, and it creates, it has created some problems and, and difficulties in presenting the gospel. When you present the gospel, that Jesus has entrusted us with, what Jesus commands us, what Jesus teaches us. And the fact that, you know, I think Jeanette was uh, referring to this last week or recently, Proverbs 3, 5, 5 and 6, you know, uh, lean not to your own understanding. We, our ideas today are as good as God's in, in, in the way people think because we can argue with God. Someone was arguing with me yesterday about how God had cursed them and God has just cursed their life. And I'm thinking, no, that's, that's not true. God has, you have problems, yes, but God isn't in the business of cursing us. And, um, but I, you know, I couldn't convince them otherwise, but that's, that's how it goes. So when we look at it here, so when we think about uh, continue to present the, go- the gospel of God in the light of God in the teachings and without impure motives, we're not trying to trick you. He says, we speak um, as men approved by God. Now, again, in this trusting us in the gospel, it has to be approved by God. Um, even Paul in his travels and journeys He couldn't go into Europe until God opened a door for him. We oftentimes, we are are people who press God in terms of time. We want things done in our time. 
and God isn't God has reasons for doing his timing and I just believe I'm a strong believer that God does things at just the right time that doesn't mean it's easy and it doesn't mean that's exactly when I well, I want it done but I believe it at just the right time Christ came at just in the fullness of time at just the right time uh, God works in incredible and wonderful ways and as much as we might want Jesus to come immediately this moment it, it Jesus will come at just the right time according to the father's will and so even in presenting the gospel we have to be careful and this is a, another uh, no one can come to Christ except the father draws him and God has to open up their mind and, and work with it and oftentimes we want to get a hammer and chisel and break open everything and and tell them like it is and let the chips fall where they may and yet we find that that is not the way that Jesus presented the gospel for th this example is given to us by Jesus himself where he said I have many things to say unto you but you're not yet ready I think this is, is entrusting us with the gospel entrusting us with the gospel that it's, we have to seek God's will and when to say things when not to say things and it's not always easy so he says here, um, again, and that verse five, as we, we read on here, he says, you know, we never use flattery. Um, that's, nor did we put on a mask of cover up of greed. God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from men, not from you or anybody else. Now this in trust, God entrusting us to the gospel, the, the gospel to us is, it's not out of greed. It's not out of pleasing, as he says, even pleasing the believer or uh, anyone else. It is not about being men pleasers. So he is trusting us n not to be doing that with the gospel, but to when we think about who, who are we pleasing, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, we're that is what we're doing in presenting the gospel. Then he goes on here, um, because people can have the wrong motive, and I think, um, again, the King, King James Version uses flattery, covetousness, glory, and burdensome. So let's just take a look at religion. Religion sometimes can use flattery. They, they can flatter us and our own righteousness. Uh, Satan kind of used flattery and flattering Adam and Eve and we can be flattered. Covetousness, uh, we want to build something great, uh, our own church and make it great and we can be covetous. Glory, that is one of the things that can, it's bigger and better and glorious and all the praise around that. Or then it can be burdensome in law. You, you make the law and the traditions and you, you bring people into that particular burden thinking that they're doing exactly what's right and we put heavy things on people. But people go for that. People go for structure, for things that are rigid. They want to, you know, just, I want to know and I want to be right. And, and that's not the gospel. That is not the good news. So we, we see all these. So he says, in essence, in verse 7 through 9, again, as we read here, uh, as apostles of Christ, we have been, we could have been a burden to you, but we were gentle among you. Like a mother caring for her little children, we loved you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well, because you had become so dear to us. Surely you remember, brothers, our toil and hardship. We worked night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. So we find here that the gospel is presented in a humble, gentle, as, as cherished children. So when 
Jesus has entrusted us with the gospel. This is how we present it. So what did Jesus tell Peter in John 21? Peter, if you love me, feed my sheep. Now, he didn't say goats. This is the attitude that we have toward their sheep that God is working with, we work with, and we are sheep as well. There's a humble attitude. Now, then it tells us in verse 10 here about the gospel giver's behavior. So we're, we're gospel givers, but what is our behavior? You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. The, this, this point of being holy, justly, unblameably among believers. This is how we present the gospel. This is how they work. This is what Jesus has entrusted us in presenting the gospel to others. Now, in verses 11 through 13, we find, as it were, the method and purpose of teaching the gospel. Beginning in verse 11, for you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God. Now, again, we think about what Jesus teaches us, lives worthy of God, who calls you into his kingdom and glory. Into his, we, we've talked about the kingdom of the Son. We talked about what kingdom is. We talk about the things that Jesus commands us and directs us to believe. And we also thank God continually because you have received the word of God, which you've heard from us. You accepted it not as the word of men, but as it actually is the word of God. So the gospel is the word of God. It is what Jesus was anointed to preach. It is what Jesus did preach, which is at work in you who believe. So the gospel is working in us. This is the purpose and the teaching that we we are given. So, for you brothers became imitators of God's churches in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. You suffered from your your own countrymen, the same things the churches suffered from the Jews. So we find here the gospel is exhortation, it is comforting, and as he says, as you were charged to do. As a father, you know, teaches his children. There's, as, remember what Jesus said in the Great Commission? I have been given all authority in heaven and earth, and that you walk worthy of God who has called you into his kingdom of glory. So how is it received? As the word of God and not the word of men. And you trust that work which is within you. When we think about the work within us, we think about the Holy Spirit doing the work in us. Now, verses 14 through 16 talk about the suffering of the gospel. From one's own countrymen, and that they please not God. So I'm going to, I'll read this and then we're going to take a look at this. For you, brothers, became imitators of God's churches in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. You suffered for your own countrymen the same things those churches suffered from the Jews who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and also drove us out. They displease God and are hostile to all men in their effort to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they might be saved in the same way always heap upon their sins to the limit the wrath of God has come upon them at last now here's one of the things that I want us to again reflect on terms of teach all nations the apostle Paul says all those this again in Galatians 3, I believe 28, where it says, you know, uh, there, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, bond free, male or female, we're all one in Christ. Which leads me to believe, and when we see the problem they have, 
the willingness that, that Jesus trusts us to teach gospel and trust us with that gospel to teach it to people the way he taught it with the same love. So let's take some examples. Jesus taught the gospel to Mary, a sinner, to Martha, to Lazarus, to poor. He taught it out of love and he brought them up to raise them up with him as friends whom he loved. Now I want to take a moment to speak racially. It was the Jews who, as a select people of God, God had given them promise, but they were unwilling to share the gospel, not only with sinners, but also with Gentiles. And they put them down. Jesus has called us and entrusted us with the gospel to present it with the same hope, the same love, uh, the same presentation that he has and the love he has for all mankind. You cannot dismiss this because the statement in John 3.16 that we talk about, for God so loved the world, we can begin to think and that we are better than everybody else. And there are people, there, there, there are white supremacists who think that they're an elite group. There was the world of the Nazis. Uh, they're the world of people who don't like people of color, of different nationalities and all of that. If Jesus is, the gospel is the gospel is the gospel, God is God is God, and Jesus is Jesus, and the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit, we are called to be the bride of Christ. We have to be entrusted. And we need to realize that entrusting the gospel to us, that whoever we present the gospel to, that we love with the heart of God, the mind of God, and not as looking down or being better than. So that, that includes sinners, that includes people that are not like us, that includes people of different genders, when I say men and women and the like, you know, because men, women, we're, we're in this together. Jesus has raised us up. So when he entrusts that gospel to us, the, the enthusiasm that we have to present it to all that God brings into our path. Now, we, we know that we, we, we all tend to have a greater enthusiasm to present the gospel to our family and to our loved ones uh, much more than we maybe have some other folk in our lives. Um, but I'm just saying it's a challenge, and the Apostle Paul encountered that. And so when he said, you know, he, the Jews... Their approach to presenting it to Gentiles, they didn't like them. You know, their shadow could, just all the things that we know work in the division of people racially or gender-wise and, and, and that. So in the presentation of the gospel, um, your own countrymen. So when, now having said this, I want to say one other thing. So you and I, will find opposition to the gospel, to what Jesus said. We will find where you're called a bigot and that your love is called hate and hate love. We, we will find those kind of things in, in presenting the gospel. But if we're to be trusted with the gospel, we, we have to refer back to what Jesus did and who he is and what the gospel is for, what the gospel teaches us and the like. So we see that with the apostle Paul. So then he goes on that these individuals did not please God. So verses 17 through 20, as we wind up here, but brothers, when we were torn away from you, you for a short time in person, not in thought, out of our intense longing, we made every effort to see you, 
for we wanted to come to you. Certainly I, Paul, did again and again, but Satan stopped us. For what is our hope, our joy, or our crown in which we glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ when he comes? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and joy. The gospel, and I think these are the words that Jesus would say in the same way. Jesus trusts us to share the gospel in his way with all of his commands as we observe all things that he has commanded us. The gospel is good news for all of those who believe and I would share the good news in the gospel is that Jesus trusts you to share the gospel and that is not easy. Trust. You are trusted with the gospel of Jesus Christ in joy. And he enjoys trusting you now, tomorrow, and forever. Let's conclude in prayer. Father, we thank you very much that you would be so kind to share your word, your son with us, and that we in turn can share it with other individuals as well. We ask for your guidance, your direction, for your wisdom, because all this is as wonderful as it is, it is not always easy to know exactly when, how to do that. But we pray that what, how we do it and when may be pleasing your sight. So thank you for, for trusting us. May we trust you and do your will to your glory, your praise and honor. In Jesus' name, we give you thanks. Amen. The world today is a challenging environment for Christian believers and followers of Jesus Christ. Looking for answers? Grace Communion International local churches in Fairfield, Santa Rosa, and Modesto offers a comforting environment for Christians in search of spiritual growth and development. Contact a local ministry. Attend their local GCI churches at the times listed on your screen.